Hello, welcome to the Friday, November 10th, 2017 edition of the Sands and Storm Center's Stormcast. My name is Johannes Ulrich and today I'm recording from Jacksonville, Florida. We continue to have problems with developers storing credentials in code being delivered to users. The latest case are Twilio credentials. Twilio, if you're not familiar with that, is a very popular service that allows you to send SMS messages, also allows for voice interaction, voice messages, even some video conferencing capabilities. So a lot of mobile applications that use these functionalities are using Twilio for sort of the plumbing part of actually sending the messages. And then the app itself will just send a request to Twilio's web service in order to, for example, establish a call. Now, Twilio on its website actually has some guidance for different applications and languages, how to set up per user tokens for authentication. Essentially, what you're supposed to do is that the user will connect to the developer's web service, will receive a token from the developer, and then use that token to directly authenticate to Twilio. Now, this process, of course, requires some extra work. So a lot of developers will just include their own key in the application, which then results in all applications or all users using the same code. Once different users share the same API key, there is of course no separation anymore between these users as far as Twilio is concerned. And now all of these users have access to all data being submitted to Twilio, like for example, call logs, logs of messages, and well, everything Twilio has to offer. This isn't the first time something like this happens. Uh, We have seen this quite often, for example, with credentials for Amazon web servers that are just being embedded in mobile applications. Too often, developers believe that by delivering a binary blob to the user, that the user will not be able to extract these credentials. But of course, it's really not all that difficult. And as in this example with Twilio, can easily be done and even in some cases automated. For example, I think it was about a year ago that someone went through this with Amazon credentials and they even created a little web application that can upload an Android application and it will try to automatically check the application for any Amazon credentials and extract them. And then we caught a couple different news items and reports here about crypto coin mining again, and in particular, the crypto coin mining done by web browsers if they're hitting a website that loads the famous CoinHive Monero mining code. Malwarebytes, for one, notes that its software blocked so far 8 million different attempts to load the CoinHive JavaScript code into its users' browsers. I don't actually think that number is really all that impressive given how many people are using Malwarebytes, but uh, certainly still significant. Another study by Red Volcano looked at the top 3 million websites. They found that about 2,500 of them are loading the CoinHive code and one within the top 1,000. In particular, with compromised websites that have in the past more often been used to load malicious software into unsuspecting visitors' browsers, there is now a tendency to load the CoinHive miner instead. The result is the same to the attacker, that the attacker is getting revenue from the compromised website. And it's probably less likely that this CoinHive code gets discovered and removed than Malware. And then we got more details about Intel's management engine. If you remember, Intel's management engine is included in its more recent chipsets and essentially sort of orchestrating all the different features of the CPU and various peripherals. Now, the management engine, it's really sort of its computer itself. And 
And we have uh, more news here from Positive Technologies, in particular Maxim Gorayic, uh, who looked into uh, this uh, particular management engine before. He, for example, found earlier this year a way to turn it off. And now he actually managed uh, to sort of get complete access to the management engine via a built-in USB port that he used to access it. And in doing so, he found out that it's actually based on Minix, which is, well, a small Unix-based operating system. Now, what's particularly interesting is that this JTAG or sort of debug interface isn't something that you sort of have to connect wires to yourself as you may have seen it, for example, in embedded systems. But instead, uh, Intel actually built in a specific feature that allows an external USB port to be used to essentially reroute it to this JTAG interface. And with that, well, no wires required, uh, pretty easy to then pull the firmware off the system. So yet another reason why you don't want to connect untrusted devices to your USB port because if someone takes advantage of a vulnerability in the system, then of course they would be able to change the firmware on this management engine, which of course is pretty impossible to discover and correct. Google, by the way, is working on a Linux-based replacement for this management engine. We will have to see if this ends up being something more secure than what Intel came up with. And uh, by the way, I'll only be teaching once more at the public conference this year. So if you're interested in IPv6, December 12th and 13th, it's only two days in Washington DC, followed by another class, Defending Web Application Security Essentials, that uh, I'll be teaching December 14th through 19th, also in Washington DC. And as always, you can find links to these classes at the very bottom of the show notes page. Well, uh, that's it for today. Thanks for listening and talk to you again on Monday. Bye.